Let's take a look at a aldehyde. And let's treat it with a Grignard reagent. And that's step one. And then step two, we'll have to do a aqueous workup. And what's going to happen? This methyl group right here is going to form a bond with that carbonyl carbon. So we have and then that would turn it into, so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then this methyl right here came from the green yard. Okay, so we are going to generate a alcohol. And that can happen with aldehydes or a ketone. Now, these conditions right here, green yard is basic. Those basic conditions. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the mechanism. That's sp2 hybridized. Now, you can look at the green yard like this. You could look at the mechanism like this, in which this bond right here can attack from the front face or the back face. So what's that going to do? That's going to give us a racemic mixture. So with the Grignards, you have to watch when you form that carbon-carbon bond right here, this carbon-carbon bond, are you generating a stereocenter or not? And here we are. So you got to realize that you're going to get a racemic mixture. Now you can also look at Grignard reagents. Okay. Let's look at it generically. Let's look at a generic Grignard. If this helps you, then look at Grignards like this. You could look at this whole species simply as a R minus. So if I take that, that principle here and apply it to this right there, I could very well have said, hey, this piece is my R, and it says it's just an R minus. So I could actually have written it like this, a CH3 minus. And then I could have used that to see my nucleophile. And so you can see that right there is there and there. Either way works for me. If you want to do the mechanism with the whole Grignard thing written out, that's fine. Or you could say, hey, this is, base is equivalent to this. If you say that or write that down, then I'll be like, oh, this coming and attacking. Perfect. Okay. And that same principle also applies for the hydrides as well. So you could say lithium aluminum hydride is the same thing as H minus. And that's going to act as our nucleophile. And we saw that in the previous examples. We could also look at sodium borohydride and also say, hey, that's going to be a hydride source. So if we wanted to, let's say, reduce this, reduce this with a sodium borohydride in some methanol, mechanistically, you could say this guy right here is simply H minus. So that H minus will come in 
an attack like that, which will then give us our product. Now I'm skipping the protonation. Well, it would be like this. And then you'd have to do a proton transfer to protonate the alkoxide, which would then turn us into our alcohol. Okay? So general guidelines and tips when we're talking about mechanisms. The next reaction that we want to talk about is when we use cyanic acid. So I'll pause this here. So in our next reaction, we can take a ketone or an aldehyde and treat it with hydrogen cyanide with a small amount of base, your potassium cyanide. We see that how this is an ionic species. There's our metal, there's our anion species. So that's going to translate into this. So now we have a little bit of base. That's going to be our base source. And then we generate our product, which is called a cyano. Hydrin. So when you have carbon atom that's connected to an alcohol and a nitrile, we call that a cyanohydrin. Now I misspoke when I called this compound cyanic acid. I did say that. And that is wrong. That species that I just circled is called hydrogen cyanide. Cyanic acid looks like this. So that is cyanic acid. So they're two different compounds. I misspoke, so I needed to clarify that. So we have to treat it, the ketone or aldehyde, with our hydrogen cyanide and potassium cyanide, which is going to act as our base to give us our cyanohydrin. So this reaction works best under basic conditions. And that is why we're adding this species right here to make it basic. So when we look at this mechanistically, let's take a look at that. What's happening here is that we're going to have our hydrogen cyanide okay, like this, and then we have this species right here, which acts as the base. So this right here is used to help deprotonate that. Okay. That's going to come in and deprotonate it and give us more of it, okay? So there's our attacking species. Now we can take that attacking species now, and if we expand this guy out, it looks like this. Okay, boom, boom, negative charge, just like that, okay? So there's our cyanide anion. And that is going to come in and attack like so. And that process is reversible. So we are going to have negative like that. And then Because we're only adding a little bit of this, we're still going to have our acid present right here. So 
that's going to be our proton source to protonate that alkoxide. So that will give us our cyanohydrin. And then you've just generated more of that. So that's a very simple, straightforward mechanism to generate the cyanohydrin. Nothing too special about that. Let's see here. What's the next thing that we want to talk about? Once again, when you form your product, so your cyanohydrin here, what, did, what do we have to always, always be careful of? What did I generate there? A stereo center. So you're going to have a racemic mixture that you need to be aware of. It's not just going to give you one product. You created a stereo center. So the attacking species can attack from the front face or the back face. And that's why you're going to get that racemic mixture. Always, always watch out for that. But why are cyanohydrin molecules so important that we have to even talk about them? Well, one is we formed a carbon-carbon bond. That's big. But we have also added another functionality, this nitrile, that we can do reactions with. So if you treat that with a lithium aluminum hydride and then do your aqueous workup, what you can do now is you can take that nitrile and you can reduce it into the amine. You just reduced it to the primary amine. So that's really important because now you have an amine. Now the amine can go do another reaction and so forth, right? So it's adding functionality to it. What if we what if we added some acid to this and added some heat? That now is going to oxidize the nitrile into a carboxylic acid. So carbon there, OH. Just like that. So now we can make carboxylic acids from the cyanohydrin. So that's a really cool feature about forming cyanohydrins. You can make different compounds from it. But when you look at this, these products right here, pause for a moment. You see how we have, wait, that's not going to be a stereo center. So those are not stereo centers. They would be stereo centers if we tack on another carbon. Now they're stereo centers. Be very careful. So you're going to get a racemic mixture. So I am now out of time with the recording studio. So this is where I'm going to stop this video. In the next videos, we are going to start learning about a reaction called a, a Wittig. W-I-T-T-I-G, the Wittig reaction. Not Wittig, it's pronounced Wittig with the V. And 
That's a really cool reaction because we are once again forming a carbon-carbon bond. So if we take a ketone or an aldehyde, okay, and we treat it with a Wittig reagent, which one do I want to do? Let's do this one. So we have a carbon bonded to a phosphorus atom, which is then bonded to three benzene rings. And this particular compound is going to have the positive charge on the phosphorus and a negative charge on the carbon. And now this carbon is electron rich, so it can react with the electron poor carbonyl carbon. So we do this reaction. I'm just going to draw the arrow there. We take this species, ketone or aldehyde, and, and watch what happens. It takes this piece right here and replaces it with the oxygen. Or the carbon replaces the oxygen, like this. R, double bond, CH2. Do you see how this group right here kicks off the oxygen and replaces it with that CH2? This species right here, this is called a yilid. And a yilid, by definition, is a carbon atom that is negatively charged that is directly attached to a heteroatom that is positively charged. That is, by definition, a yield. Now I want to take a look at the yield and look at that in a little bit more detail right now before we stop this. So if we have a, let's put it over here. Negatively charged there. Okay, so that's our yield. So this yield could have a resonance structure. And the yield adds the lone pair right there. So we could have a resonance structure in which the lone pair right there comes in to look like this. Now, based off of our understanding of Orgo 1, when you look at these two resonance structures, which one would you predict would be the most stable resonance structure? Well, hopefully everyone would say this one. And the reason behind it is these have formal charges, these do not. Typically, well, what we learned in Orgo 1 is if there's no formal charges, that's going to be the more stable resonance structure, or the another way of saying it, the resonance structure that contributes to the resonance hybrid more so, or contributes more. But in this particular case, that rationale does not work. It right? does not work. And the reason why it does not work is because the carbon and the phosphorus are in different groups or different periods. That's what I need to say, different periods. And because they're in different periods, they're drastically different in size. And so these, this lone pair, when it comes in and overlaps with the orbitals here on the phosphorus, that is not a pH. That's a phosphorus. It 
it just has really, really horrible overlap due to the, this being in one period, this being in another period. And so actually, the more stable resonance structure is going to be this one due to the poor over, over, due to the poor orbital overlap. Okay, so when we come back, we will take a look at the mechanism of how this works. And then we'll also talk about how do we synthesize the yield. Okay.